Pixel Sift is proudly supported by the Murdoch University School of Arts. Have you ever thought to yourself, I'd really love to learn how to make something creative like a game or YouTube channel or report on the news? Well, you should have a look at what is on offer at Murdoch University. They'll give you the skills to hit the awesome creative goals you're aiming for. Keen to learn more? Have a look at murdoch.edu forward slash arts to find out what they've got on offer. That's murdoch.edu forward slash arts, or you can search Murdoch University for more information. Murdoch University School of Arts, proudly supporting Pixel Sift. Hello and welcome to Pixel Sift, the show dedicated to indie games from around Australia and the world. This is our last episode before the Christmas break, and my name is Daniel, and joining me tonight is my co-host Fiona. How are you today? First uh, episode we've done together, isn't it? Isn't it is. that exciting? It is, yeah. Uh, yesterday we were playing Life is Strange, and so we just keep the ball rolling. So here we go. <laughs> here we go. Uh, joining us this week is Sean Tur, who is the co-founder and CEO of Battle Brew Productions. He's here today to talk about their new game, Battle Sky Brigade Harpuna. Thanks so much for joining us, Sean. Hey, man. Uh, good to be here. Awesome. Um, so that's coming up in a second, but uh, first, what are we talking about, Fiona? So tonight we'll also be talking about franchises, what it takes to make one, and how to keep it going. All right, let's get into it. Australia's best video game podcast. Subscribe to Pixel Sift on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever podcasts are found. So with the recent re-release of Halo Reach, it's clear that franchises are still very popular and they're here to stay and they're very successful. So tonight we'll be talking about what franchises are, how they're developed and all the things in between. But first, Daniel, how do you define what a franchise is? Okay, so a game franchise is an iterative series of game products developed around a demand for the services slash value of an intellectual property. Um, We've got an article here written by Alyssa McAloon. Um, about Bungie specifically. And so recently Bungie have split from Activision and they're able to do sort of, you know, go down different creative ventures and explore other IPs apart from just Destiny. Um, On the topic of the Activision split, Parsons tells IGN that parting ways with Activision was somewhat of a turning point for the company that has become a really bright shining spot on our ability to bring products to the marketplace and customers. Um, So Sean, what's your favorite video game franchise and why? Uh, hmm. I mean, there's, there's quite a lot, so it's a bit tough to pick one. Um, I think right now I've gone back to playing Diablo 3 because um, there's, I mean, the seasonals are on. Uh, D4 has been announced as well. So I think, yeah, Diablo is one of the ones that I've um, played since the start. Diablo 1, in fact. Um, and I'm still playing the Diablo series today, so I guess you could count that as one of my favorites, even though, um, yeah, there's big breaks in between the various games. Mm. It seems that as uh, franchises sort of go in and out of the collective consciousness, um, it seems like the ones that we really hold dear, we keep going back to. Uh, and it seems like it always have a special place in our hearts. I was going back to Zelda. I can never stop going back to Zelda. Yeah, no yeah. No matter which one it is, sometimes we just jump back onto Ocarina of Time and play, get stuck, and then I'll switch to another game. <laughs> Definitely. And especially on the topic of uh, remasters and that sort of thing, it seems like uh, Spyro mm. and Crash Bandicoot and all these, mm. you know, sort of nostalgia things that I grew up with, and they're redoing it. And so you go back to it and you revisit it, and it's sort of, it's still at the back of your mind. You still remember it. You might not have thought about it for a couple of years, but it's still there. Mm. Um, and Sean, so the game that you're currently working on is actually part of a tra- uh, franchise. And was this your plan mm-hmm. from the beginning? Uh, no, it wasn't actually. Um we actually started out making a much larger strategy game, Battle Sky Brigade. Um, That kind of pivoted at one point. uh, And that game, which is still unfinished, became Battle Sky Brigade Tribes. Uh, We ended up launching a much smaller game, uh, just town building, Idle Clicker. Uh, That was Battle Sky Brigade Tap Tap. I think it was at that point when we did the pivot uh, that we kind of um, sort of made the decision to make it into a franchise instead. Uh, but no, that wasn't like the full uh, necessary business plan from the start. It was uh, something that evolved along the way. So what kind of pushed you? You mentioned that like you eventually turned it into a bit of a franchise. What really pushed you to 
make it into a franchise because you could have just released one or two games, but you've released quite a lot in in that series. Um, okay, it's it's actually probably a boring answer, but uh, it's it's partly coming down to production issues as well. Um, so we had to uh, pivot fast, and we realized that um, number one, the IP had value on its own. Uh, what I mean by that. So we were at some game shows, including Tokyo Game Show, uh, G-Star, and um, a lot of uh, female gamers came up to us and they were like, this game is, is adorable, uh, but how do you play this? And at that point, we were basically exhibiting the strategy game. Um, and some of them didn't necessarily want to play a strategy game. Uh, they came, up, came back to us with a lot of ideas from like your say almost more stereotypical farming type game. Uh, town building was a big request. Uh, racing, snowboarding was one. Uh, and then we realized, oh, wait a minute, that's, that's not too hard to do. We could actually over time fulfill um, their own, I mean, their request. It'd be essentially be remixing and game jamming our own uh, game and products. Um, and that's basically what happened. So, I mean, even the latest game, Battle Sky Brigade Harpuna, um, came up from a combination of game jams, sketches, what we wanted to do, and we realized, wait, it's not that hard to, to build this world because we have um, half the world built already. And I think that, that's, that's part of the key thing. We looked at it and go, oh, it wasn't just about uh, reusing um, assets, um, but you could build different parts of the world and make each game in a series stronger rather than just a standalone thing. Now, with because you've you've started making a bit of a franchise and all these different games that are under the same title, do you have you gone back and made a bit of a lore? Because a lot of franchises like Destiny or or Mario or Zelda, they have like background lore. Do you have that sort of for your game, or are you interested in making some background lore? Um, okay, I think the, the games that we have launched ended up being uh, smaller titles first. So Battle Sky Brigade Tap Tap focuses on you, the player, trying to build your own floating town slash pit stop sort of thing in the world of Battle Sky Brigade. Uh, Battle Sky Brigade Harpuna focuses on a very different aspect of that world. Uh, you're now a salvager in the wilds and you're trying to be the best salvager uh, there ever was, basically. Um, I think we're still trying to figure it out. Um, I wouldn't say we've, we've got a really tight handle on it. Um, we also made different characters to try and keep the lore consistent. Uh, more like we're unlocking different facets and different parts of the world of Battle Sky Brigade as it is. Uh, we like to maybe properly sit down and, and have a proper, proper lore bible someday, but um, yeah, currently we're still making smaller games, so we haven't run into that issue yet or the issue of for example having to retcon something um so yeah i'm still figuring it out it's my answer there's a interesting uh technique i suppose when it comes down to writing ips and fleshing worlds out i remember there was this interview with george R. R. martin uh writer of game of thrones and he's known as uh, a gardener basically so he writes mm -hmm. a bunch of different plot points but rather than sticking to a t about every single thing that he did at the beginning, he sort of lets them evolve and grow as time sort of goes on and as he gets different sort of influences. Is this similar to how you approach uh, the world building and creating the lore for these characters and, and these games? Um, I think in the background, you could say so. Um, means we have ideas about unreleased I like places in, in the world of Battle Sky Brigade, uh, characters that haven't been released in any of the games yet. Uh, but when it comes down to the individual game, example, Harpuna, uh, I think it's the reverse. Um, it was more of a plotter-type approach. Uh, I think I've read that article as well. So plotter would be more on the certain key points we kind of need to hit, uh, the certain different areas you need to go to. Um, and the narrative is not um, something at this point that's very complex for our games. Uh, world building is a little bit more visual in, in Battle Sky Brigade, so we haven't fully run into the issue yet. Now, if we were to, example, make an RPG-ish type game uh, in this series, then we'd have to really sit down and 
and figure this out and have a lot more pre-pro time. Um, but Harpoona was more of a mechanics-based game. So it's just very simple. Okay, uh, you play as Pim, you want to be the best salvager, what's getting in your way to doing that, are the things you have to do, places you have to go. Just very, very simple story for that one. So that was just plotted out. Fantastic. And just going over to uh, some of our questions, uh, answers that we've gotten on our different social media platforms um, as far as franchises go, uh, Gianni on Facebook says, I'm playing through Halo Reach right now, and man, this is a great series. I never played Halo 5 as I didn't have an Xbox until very recently, but I'm keen to get in on that. Um, we also have Tommy O over on Twitter that says, Assassin's Creed. Before the first one came out, I pretty much only played shooters, and it hooked me immediately. The different historical settings kept me going throughout the whole series, and Portal is also a close second. Um, one thing I've noticed about franchises recently is it seems that a lot of the games that were really popular, say, in the 90s or even, you know, a while ago, a decade ago, have sort of made a resurgence now. And there's a newer way that we're interpreting our heroes and characters um, that's quite interesting. And one example that comes to mind is God of War. And so before we had Kratos, who was very, very angry. And now when it comes back and they've sort of revisited that franchise um, after it was on break for about five years, it seems like they've really, it's moved with society and with the times. Mm -hmm. So how do you, uh, Sean, how do you expect a franchise to change? And do you think that it's necessary for franchises to change as society moves forward? Uh, I would definitely agree with that. But I mean, it's, it's might not even be a conscious choice sometimes. Um, I mean, interesting that you talk about God of War. Um, and other old franchises that we kind of grew up with, right? Uh, but that's the key point. We, we grow up, and not only does the audience grow up, the, the creators grow up as well. And whatever happens in our lives, uh, example, like, you know, you have kids, that would definitely change your perspective on um, so many, many things. Um, it's also said that the art of an age, um, it's kind of a dirty statement, right? The, the art of an age reflects that age. And uh, I think it's only a natural thing that, that happens. Um, that our franchises would evolve with us. Um, I mean, yeah, we're talking about games, for example, but like um, even anime. So Naruto now has Boruto, and we have kind of mixed feelings about that sometimes. But um, yeah, you know, you watch characters grow old, they, they have a new generation. I think that's um, in some way a, a heartening look at seeing how, how franchises can evolve. Uh, on the business side, I'm sure for the businesses, for a lot of them, it makes sense as well because you have this pre-established um, audience that's already invested in in that world. So we have a quote here from Activision's Blizzard CEO, Bobby Kotick, and I think this might be a good one to end on. So he says that uh, franchises are essential to their strategy and that they perpetrate our fa uh, franchises, then we selectively introduce new ones. And then if there are categories of business that we don't think we have the skills to be able to create a game around, we may do an acquis acquisition, but those are rare. So it seems as though not only a franchise is popular for all the players, it's a good marketing thing and good way for the companies to stay involved within the gaming uh, society and community and also financially as well. Mm. Mm. Mitch, what's Discord? Discord is an online chat service that most gamers use. Incidentally, you can also use it to talk to us at pixelsiv.com.au forward slash Discord. Yeah, you can talk about uh, episodes, you can talk about upcoming topics, you can probably even coerce Mitch into playing a game with you online. That's not going to happen. That is going to happen. You're doing it. I'm saying that's happening. Sorry. Yeah, well... Why Join you, Discord. You should grow your beard back. pixelsiv.com.au forward slash Discord. Today, we are joined by Sean To, co-founder and CEO of Battle Brew Productions, and he's here to tell us about the new game, Battle Sky Brigade Harpuno. So, Sean, um, for those who don't know, what is Battle Sky Brigade Harpuno? Okay, so Battle Sky Brigade Harpuna is uh, a vertical shooter and then a fishing game or a reverse vertical shooter. Uh, what I mean by that? So, you fly up... Um, you're basically piloting yourself a small airship. You have a rope attached to the end of it. Uh, when you run off rope or you, your ship takes enough damage, you then get reeled back and collect everything that you shot open. Um, yeah, that's Belskar Brigade Harpuna. You're playing as Pim, uh, who's a cute bunny. It's a race that we call the Smolians. And he's trying to be the best salvager and 
all of those type of games. So um, just earlier, we were also talking about franchises and how the IP sort of evolved. Um, where did the idea originally come from in this game? Because I've, I've noticed that with each new iteration of, of the game and each new version, there's different gameplay mechanics that you guys are introducing. And so, um, mm -hmm. yeah, could you talk a bit about that? Okay. Um, so the team... I mean, okay, number one, I guess we like variety. Uh, number two we do the annual global game jam although this wasn't spawned from that um we have sort of a, a backlog or a treasure chest of of ideas and they come from a lot of different places uh harpuna was partly inspired by two things of combination uh one was a bunch of sketches uh and these were inspired by claw machines um yeah claw machines um you know those those japanese game machines where you mm. press a button and this claw extends and you try and pick stuff up notoriously hard. Um, <laughs> terrible at those games <laughs> well i mean most of them are kind of rigged but yeah. there's techniques that you can you can do right mm. so we had a sketch for an airship that had a claw at the bottom and that sketch actually spawned um more than one idea um but harpuna i guess was the one who ended up working out um from from that inspiration and sketch. Um, you know, we played around with an early demo of, okay, we have this ship, what does it do? Okay, why don't you pick up stuff? Uh, does it have guns? Yeah, we can shoot stuff. And a bunch of us play vertical shooters, or rather, we play a lot of genres. Um, but yeah, vertical shooter, why not uh, a reverse vertical shooter? What would that look like? It's, it's, it's hard to put a pinpoint on it because a lot of it happens organically. But mm. Yeah, vertical shooter, reverse vertical shooter. So we've already got one comment in the chat from Yellow Materia saying this mm -hmm. game looks cute, and I absolutely agree. It looks like so much fun as well. Now, you mentioned there was a bit of a, a shooter, but also a fishing game. Why a shooter fishing game? Where, why did you decide to combine those two things? Um, I guess, okay, I mean, our studio's approach is we tend to design mobile first. Um, and yeah, we wanted something easy to play, uh, something that we would enjoy as well, something with a lot more um, twitch trigger action control. I'm not quite sure how to say that. Versus, say, uh, Battle Scrap Brigade Tap Tap, which is an idle clicker, right? So we're kind of like, uh, okay, we've got an idle clicker out. Can we go back to um, some kind of manual controls? Um, yeah, uh, we did the vertical shooter. And it was a combination of things of like, what if we are playing with that shit that we had to sketch off? Uh, the one with the, the claw, does it mean we can um, shoot the claw forward? And then, I mean, we even had like weird boss, boss fight designs where you could use the claw to um, dismantle the boss strategically. That would be but, cool. Uh, mm. what? It would be cool maybe for a future game. Yeah. Um, mm. But um, yeah, a, a, lot of, a lot of ideas came up. The one uh, prototype, that ended up um, being the one that we ran with was Harpuna. So simple enough, you just shoot on the way up and then you come back down and collect the stuff that you shot. Seemed like a, a neat game loop. You know, I mean, it's like well wrapped up in itself. Um, and yeah, that's actually what, what we ran with. Um, well, I love it's organic. So what kinds yeah. of uh, challenges did you face when integrating uh, those two things together for the game? Um, I think the the core mechanic was simple enough. It's more questions of meta, uh, meta building, aka um, how much um, example of an RPG ish aspect do we want uh, to add to this? Uh, how many upgrades or how much variety can we add to the gameplay uh, that was meaningful? Um, what else could we do with that? I think at one point there was also uh, the fear that it was too simple. Um, and then trying to decide on the complexity level and the difficulty level uh, was, was also something that, that I think we spent some time discussing. Uh, we ended up going on a bit more, uh, what we thought at the time, a bit more casual side, aka um, the ship, there's no like the button to tap to fire, it fires when you don't fire. 
uh, we didn't want the difficulty level to be, uh, if you guys are familiar with like Toho or Ikaruga, like super hardcore shooter style, we didn't want bullet hell. Um, so we opted for a more casual thing. But we still, I mean, when we play tested uh, with public, we still found that there were some difficulties in the mechanics that people were like, oh, wait, there's a net, I have to come back, etc. Uh, some people, um, there's definitely an element of, of joyful surprise when you find out, oh, wait, uh, I'm not collecting the coins on a way up, but wait, I, I can come back down. That was cool. But there's still a bunch of easing in to do uh, because it's a, you know, it's a twist on the genre. Thanks for watching Pixel Sift. If you're just joining us, we are talking to Sean To about his new game, Battle Sky Brigade Harpooner. And uh, Sean, you mentioned earlier with the sketch and sort of that idea being developed uh, into the uh, shoot 'em up fishing game. Are there any sort of game formats that you guys at Battle Brew have started developing that just didn't work? Mm. I think it's more. It's not so much a matter of it doesn't work. It's more a question of how far um, can it go? Like at the. Global Game Jam, I think, was it this year? We created something called You Are a Good, Good, Good Bird. Bird, yeah. <laughs> I love and the it was name about, of that. like, waking up. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a ridiculous song to go with it. Um, oh, wow. It's, it's very slangy. Um, but, but, yeah, uh, you're supposed to be this angry bird. In Singapore, it's called a minor. And, and it does this ooh sound, like, ooh -woo, And it wakes you up. Um, and... Basically, you place a bird and you try and well, and you wake people up. But I mean, how far do you go with that, right? And then you're trying to. Mm. Um, yeah, so I guess it's it's more a matter of um, not so much working out smart, like seeing what can go further, which is exactly what we were discussing with for Harpuna. How could we expand this? Uh, I think happily we've we've now hit the other end of that and we go like uh, there's things we wanted to build, um, but we don't have the, the bandwidth for uh, maybe we'll save it for the future or whatever mm. i think it's also good just exploring different avenues and, and options because um you don't know what you don't know and so that's i guess the Ooh. process of development is just seeing okay we've got the idea but what's feasible and what can we do to make it stick um Ooh. and sean as as the game continues to grow and evolve um sorry uh wrong the game is available on multiple platforms, on Apple TV, Mac, and so on. And so what sort of things did you do to make a mobile game uh, work on a non-touch screen? Um, well, I mean, actually, we play the crew is, yeah, we play a wide range of things. So we've got console players, PC players, uh, mobile players. Uh, a lot of us play on more than one console. Um, it was, I mean, yeah. It's sorry if it's boring us. It's just trial and error. Like you just play it and go like, uh, right, this is not working. That's working. Or basically, someone's audibly complaining from across the room because we're all like, we're all cramped up in a room behind me. So it's basically a studio back there. Um, but but yeah, um, it's a lot of testing. I guess there's no magic answer to that. It's more just uh, see what works, and then um, sometimes we try and beat the clock. Okay, it's like, hey, uh, can we implement a new control scheme for this? Okay, let's uh, prototype it and test it. How long will this take? Oh, God, it takes uh, five days or something. So, depends. It really depends. Mm. It sounds like a really long process. Like, even if you're just testing, like, the smallest little little thing in the game, like a button, it, it does take a long time, which I think some people don't understand when games come out and they get delayed and everything. But going back to your company and your current developing team, you're all working out of a place called Pixel Building. Could you tell us more a bit mm -hmm. about that? Um, okay, so Pixel is uh, sort of, I mean, it, it is supported by the government, uh, IMDA, which is the branch of the government that deals with tech and media. Um, so we're based here. There's a couple of other game studios here as well. Um, it's, it's quite a nice incubator. Um, yeah, there's a range of companies. There's your cryptocurrency, well, different kinds of companies that deal with that sort of stuff. VR, AR, uh, more traditional games companies like ourselves. Uh, there's an animation company around the back somewhere, I think. Um, freelancer. 
studio connection sort of company. I mean, so there's a good mix of folks here. Um, quite happy being here. Quite interesting. Do you ever go to some of the other people that share the building and pitch your ideas to them and see what they think of your ideas or get them to play test? Uh, yeah, that definitely happens. Um, so there's another studio, uh, literally about 10 meters away, um, and they uh, made an Apple Arcade as well, 10 Day Studios. I was quite a surprise uh, when we found out because, um, yeah, there's some confidentiality things, but I was like, oh, cool, okay, very, very interesting. So that's what you were working on. Um, another studio that uh, was here but just moved out is Inbar Interactive, and they actually did the audio and the sound for uh, actually all our games thus far. Now, you're also available. So, yeah, um, cool. Oh, sorry, I interrupted there. Please continue. <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's no, just, just that, um, yeah, pretty cool. Um, we have lunch together. We, we cook hot pot, um, sometimes play paintball. Yeah, it sounds fun yeah, being so able to be in a, in a building with so much, like, creativity and, mm. like, art and development going on. It, it would be really cool if they had that sort of set up in, like, different places as well. Yeah, it seems like everybody uh, elevates each other by mm. sharing ideas and being cool. sort of open. And, of course, uh, as you mentioned, sometimes there are sort of um, – NDAs or, or that sort of thing and confidentiality. But I think as a whole, being in that creative environment will definitely elevate everybody. Yep, definitely. And now you're also available on Apple Arcade while well, this game is. How much of a difference has it made uh, to the way you make money from games? Um, okay, so I can't talk about the specifics, uh, but I'll kind of happily talk about our end of stuff. Um, <laughs> I think Apple Arcade was uh, a huge opportunity for us. Um, and I mean, everybody knows how tough it is being an indie um, anyway, but I think uh, working with Apple Arcade gave us a measure of stability. Um, yeah, it was pretty cool. I mean, I had my first holiday practically because of Apple Arcade, which is nice. Um, I think it's also both... Um, how to say it. it's 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 really cool being up there, but it's also terrifying because there are lots of really uh, well established studios, uh, people whose games again you play growing up, and they're there on the same platform. And you only find out, um, I mean, some of the details after they launch or you launch, right? You just go like, wait, you know, mm. us two is here. Um, the next is Square Enix, really. Um, so yeah, I mean it's 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 pretty crazy, um, and yeah, uh, I've met the the guy who did what the golf before, and when I first played his game, I was blown away. And next thing you know, oh, Apple Arcade mixed to his game, and go like, wait, what? Um, so yeah, it's it's pretty cool, also pretty terrifying. It's nice that there's like a another platform now that indie and local developers can get on board and showcase and upload and get people to play their games and like you said next to some of the bigger companies as well it's nice that they're the bigger companies starting to include the more indie games it's always fantastic to see yeah, that happen yeah. mm. i think it's great because the level of um innovation and i mean sometimes general weirdness um, on the platform is, is quite refreshing so um even say as, as a studio to, to jump back to the original question you did ask about making money um Bell Sky Brigade Tap Tap was free to play. Um, sometimes, especially with um, rising, uh, say, how to say, advertising dollars, bidding, and all of that, it's, it's a bit more of a gamble to do F2P. Um, sometimes it's either you make a lot of money or you make a little bit. Um, premium games for indies was generally in between, but again, uh, Steam is getting saturated. I mean, okay, sure, there's Epic, but uh, like you point out, there's also, I mean, it's good to have another platform, which is Apple Arcade, um, offering cool premium style games. And yeah, we're quite happy to be part of that. Yeah. Is it a valuable alternative to other monetizing strategies for you? And um, would it also form part of your strategy going forward? Uh, definitely. I think uh, we'd definitely be happy to do uh, another title or two on Apple Arcade. Uh, but yeah, the, the world's really weird. You never know what's coming out next year as well. Um, yeah, we're, we're pretty open and flexible as a studio, but Apple Arcade has been something we're quite happy with. 
So we've talked all a bit about your new game coming out and also being in such an amazing position, being able to be around other creative places. But just to get back to the game and the company, what does the future look like for the Battle Brew team? Um, I think it's quite quite simple, actually, uh, for us. Just um, we, we're going to have to figure out what game we're going to make next year. Um, if it's a smaller one, maybe we'll see an end of year release. If it's a bigger one, then something in 2021, we'll see. And we haven't settled on which idea we're going with yet. So, future is yet to be seen. That's amazing. Uh, if you're keen to check out more of Battle Sky Brigade Harpuna, you can find it on at Battle Sky Brigade on Facebook, uh, www.battleskybrigade.com, or at Battle Sky Brig on Twitter. And uh, that's all the time that we have for today. Uh, thank you for watching or listening to episode 137 of Pixel Sift. This episode has been hosted by myself and Fiona. And thanks for joining me tonight, Fiona. No worries. Thank you for having me on. Uh, thanks a lot, Sean, for joining us as well. Hey, all good. Great to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Pixel Sift is produced by Scott Quigg, Sarah Ireland, Fiona Bartholomeus, Mitch Lowe, and Gianni Di Giovanni is our executive producer. We wouldn't have been able to make 137 episodes of Pixel Sift if we didn't have the support of Murdoch University. So please go and check them out and tell them that we sent you. If you're keen to learn more about a great creative degree, head over to murdoch.edu forward slash arts. That's murdoch.edu forward slash arts. And as always, we'll be sticking links to topics we talked about in the show notes on our website. That's on www.pixelsift.com.au. And you can come join us on Discord. We'd love to have you there. And that's pixelsift.com.au forward slash Discord. And you can share all your creative work, talk about topics and games and anything else. That again was pixelsift.com.au forward slash Discord. And then if you like what we do, could we ask you a favor? Now, we need your help to share the show. So tell a friend, subscribe, your brothers and sisters or your friends sneak onto their phones and just tap away without them knowing. So start someone's journey into podcasts because we know that getting started is tricky. But once you're in, you won't be able to leave. You'll love it too much. This was our final episode for the year, but we still have one more Pixel Sift Plays left. If you join us this time next week, we'll be playing one of the many great indie games that feature on our show. That's all for this week. Thank you for joining us, and we'll catch you next time. See ya.